Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the team at Wimby's, we'd like to thank you for joining us for today's e-roundtable webinar. My name is Binta Maxvinich. I'm a financial services executive and also a proud card-carrying member of Wimby's, or maybe I should say lapel pin-wearing member of Wimby's. We're truly glad you could join us today, and I have the privilege of being your moderator for this important discussion. We will be reviewing and looking at Exploring COVID-19 Interventions for SMEs. We will have the opportunity to glean from the wealth of experience and the knowledge and expertise of two consumer professionals who we have joining us today, Mr. Peter Bampole and Mr. Omar Shekharal, who you will meet in a short while. But before we dive into the conversation proper, I'd like to just talk to us about a few housekeeping rules. Um, the, the, in the course of the presentation of our panelists, you might have questions that you would want answers to. And we would certainly address those questions at a later time. And so we'll just encourage you to please type into the question and answer um, box on your Zoom screen, and we will get to them and deal with them appropriately. Okay. All right. I, the other thing that I would also like to share for the benefit of those of us who do not know who or what Wimby's is. Please permit me to tell you a little bit about Wimby's. Women in Management, Business and Public Service, Wimby's, is a nonprofit organization that has over the last 19 years implemented programs that inspire, empower, and educate. We advocate for greater representation of women in leadership positions in the public and private sector. Wimby's also has a contributory associate pool of over 770 accomplished women who apply their trade in the public sector and the private sector, and who are a part of over 10,000 women in our database. Wimby's also collaborates with credible domestic and international organizations to deliver programs which have influenced over 119,000 women since inception. Our vision at Wimby's is to be the catalyst that elevates the status and influence of women and their contribution to nation building. Our mission is to inspire and empower women to attain leadership positions in business, in management, and in public service. Wimby's is the first Nigerian NGO rated by NGO advisor and ranked at 428 worldwide. We missed a chance there to clap. So I'd like to see those e-claps come through at this point in time for Wimbees. Thank you so very much. Wimbees is also the only African and Nigerian affiliate partner and representative of the International Women's Entrepreneurship Challenge, IWEC Foundation. Thank you, Mrs. Oweru, I see that. Thank you so very much. Wimby's is also a volunteer-based organization that's funded largely by donations and contributions by members and partners and is a supporter for the Code of Ethics and Conduct for NGOs. There's so much more I could tell you about Wimby's, but because of our time, I'd like to encourage that for those of you who don't know and for those who need a refresher course, please visit www.wimby's.org to get more information about Wimby's. Now, without further ado, we would like to encourage you to get your notebooks ready, your electronic writing materials, and be prepared to learn from our experts who are with us today. They will enlighten us in so many ways, and I'm excited about the opportunity and what we will learn today. Our first speaker who will talk to us about that interventions that are available for SMEs and how we can access them is no other person than Mr. Peter Bampoli. He pioneered the Enterprise Development Center, EDC of the Pan-Atlantic University in January 2003. And that organization is now one of the top enterprise development centers in Africa. They have run a model which has been replicated in four African countries, namely Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda. As the director of the center, Mr. Bankale is responsible for the overall program development, capacity building, and support services to entrepreneurs. He's passionate about entrepreneurs. 
He trained as a mechanical engineer in the UK, and I, for one, would like to know how a mechanical engineer is now a dean, if you like, of entrepreneurship. He trained as a mechanical engineer in the UK under the British Petroleum Scholarship and also holds an MBA he, from the IESC Business School in Spain and is also an alumnus, obviously, of the Lagos Business School, the chief executive program. He's got 36 years cognate experience, which spans both the public and private sector, and he has had stints in the oil industry, in water, su water supply, and in the education sectors as well. His profile is so long and impressive, I won't want to bore you with all of them, but suffice it to say, that he led the Goldman Sachs 1,000, 10,000, beg your pardon, women initiative in Nigeria and was a consultant to the project in Liberia as well. He has led several other partnership programs with eminent um, companies in Nigeria and outside the shores of Nigeria. He's a certified learning and performance institute trainer and consults widely, not just in Nigeria, but in sub-Saharan Africa on an entrepreneurship development and practice programs. He's a member or sits on the board of quite a number of committees and companies. I wouldn't bore you with the longer list, but suffice it to say again that they're quite impressive. He has won, he has won many awards for his sterling work over the years. And lately in 2017, he was awarded the Member of the Year Award from the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs, ANDE, he was also the recipient of the 2017 Alumni of the Year Award from the Lagos Business School. I'm proud of him, so I can imagine how the Lagos Business School is of him as well. And in November 2018, he was conferred the Fellowship of the Society for Corporate Governance Nigeria. Mr. Bankole's current interest is in designing new learning methods. Obviously, once a teacher, always a teacher, right, Mr. Bankole? And he loves to give render each support for SME. Ladies and gentlemen, please permit me to welcome our first speaker for today, Mr. Peter Bankole. Mr. Bankole, the floor is yours, sir. I think your microphone is off, Mr. Bankole. Even when you will stop the introduction and we will get right away <laughs> into... Uh, I hope I'm not, okay, I'm not muted. Okay. Okay, so uh, basically there are, uh, let me start by sharing my slide. I'm going to make a very short presentation and then I will talk through, through the rest. Okay. So just... Okay, so uh, good afternoon again, um, ladies and the brave gentlemen that are able to join us today. So we're going to be talking about the intervention, but before I talk about the COVID, interve COVID intervention, I wanted to share uh, what we are learning uh, across the country in the last four weeks. When the pandemic broke out in, in Nigeria, we decided to do a study, which is both qualitative and quantitative. And uh, there were about 1,700 or so people that took part in that study. Because we wanted to understand the effect of what people are feeling before we can begin to make an intervention. And from the academic background, we always say, there is no need to intervene when you don't understand clearly what you want to address. But before we go, I'm going to share a poll and, and I will be, I'll be very happy if you can all take this poll for me. It's a very short poll, three questions. I'm just launching it. It's launched now, so you should be able to see it on your screen, whether you're using a phone, whether you're using a laptop, or iPad or tablet, you should be able to see it. So please go ahead and complete the poll. Usually I do this at the beginning 
of my presentation so that I can see, I can feel as well what people, um, the temperature, so to say, in the audience. I see that 16 people have already completed it. Uh, we have a long way to go, but it's been done very rapidly. There are about 373 of us online today. And we have just done 28% voting. It's moving very, very fast, very, very fast, very, very fast. So now we have about 50% completion. That is good. Once we hit 80%, 75, 80%, uh, I'll be good to go. It's just to get a good idea of everyone in the audience to see how or what we are feeling. So we're now on 68%. And the, the results I'm seeing is very interesting, although I'm going to share that with you uh, as, we, as we go along. We're doing fairly well. We're already on 73, 74%. That's good. Once we cross 75, uh, we are probably good to go. So we're already on 75%. More people are still voting. I will just give about 30 seconds more and then we will continue. Okay. So if you do not have the opportunity to vote, that's fine. Uh, we will still be able to, to continue. All right. So thank you very much for all of you that have voted. Uh, I'm going to end the vote in 10 seconds. We already have 79%. Hopefully I will get my 80% in another two seconds. Okay. All right. So we have 30 79 percent so i'm ending the vote okay so i'm going to share the vote um right now and as you can see when you hear covid 19 which best describes you how you're feeling you can see majority of us are saying we're uncertain majority are uncertain yes some have uh, some are anxious, uh, some are fearful. The brave ones amongst us, they are hopeful about the future, but majority are uncertain. Yes, in what we call a VUCA world, or certainty, it's a big one in, in that context. And um, this is not very different from the exercise we did across Nigeria. But the one that is very interesting, which also collaborates with what we did, was how was your income for the month of April? A lot of people, 64% says it has declined. Interestingly, we have like 11% says it has increased. That's very interesting. Perhaps, <laughs> yes, and it is very possible and that's some of the things I'm going to be speaking to us about because we want to move ourselves from that position of either declined or not sure to the position where it can be increasing. And that is not the intervention from the government. And you will also see that as we speak up. Now, in terms of salaries, and this is, this is the one that interests me. About a third of us says we will pay or we have paid 100% of April salary. I wonder what's going to happen in May. Mm. But the rest of us, or let me say um, 23, almost half, no, it's even more than half, are paying either 50% or less. More than half are paying 50% or less. Now that's very interesting, okay? So we stop sharing and then we'll continue. So, yeah, so that's the poll and you have seen the results according to all of you. Now, when we did our own survey across Nigeria with 1,700 or so um, uh, people or businesses, 
this is what we learn. First, we are in a situation of depressed demand. And that's precisely what this simple poll, which we've just got, uh, conducted, is also saying. When we are under lockdown, especially in Lagos, in Abuja, the chances are that not many people are selling. And there is a reason for that. Yet, there are some people, just like we have seen here, that were also selling, even while Lagos was locked down. The second thing that we see, of course, naturally flowing from the depressed demand is the fact that there is no cash or there is limited cash. So there is volatility when it comes to, uh, to cash. And what that means is that we're going to, as we increase in the lockdown or as demand depresses, we're going to run out of money. As you have seen, for those people that have paid 100% for salaries, if the situation continues, it means that those that pay 100%, half of them may choose to pay 50%. And a few more may drop even below 50%. Because they simply are not making money and they cannot pay what they are not making. But more importantly, for those that are hopeful or those that have increased in business, it means they have a different business model that aligns very well for situations of this nature. And so it is important for us to begin to rethink our business model. Now, when we talk about post-COVID, there are three areas of intervention that we need to look at. Although currently, every effort seems to be focusing on the economic side. And so the palliatives for small businesses that has been rolled out by, by government seems to focus on the economic side. And, and you can understand that. 48% of G Nigeria GDP is contributed by small and medium scale enterprises. So, if they go under, that's already half of the GDP gone under. So every meaningful government will pay attention to that. And they're already doing that. And uh, my, my colleague, uh, Mr. Omar, is going to talk around that. So I'm, I'm going to uh, skip that a little, except to tell you that there are currently a few palliatives that are already happening. For instance, out of the MSME Development Fund, um, a 50 billion uh, COVID uh, palliative is already um, in operation, even as we speak. And um, it's been managed through the central bank and um, uh, NISO. And uh, we are part of the people that are providing um, capacity building for people to be able to access uh, that fund. Again, it's split into two, and uh, Omar is going to be talking more around that. Uh, you can do household, MSME, and of course, corporate, and, and uh, the, the, the different ways in which you can, you can access it. Uh, it is slightly different from what we used to do under the MSME Development Fund, where you necessarily must have a business plan. For this one, you do not need a business plan. But beyond the economic intervention, there are two areas. Maybe the social one, people are already thinking about it. The social one, we are beginning to see it as a result of the lockdown. However, it's probably going to manifest more when we get uh, into, into um, post-COVID, when people may be losing their uh, livelihoods and so on and so forth. But the major one, which we are not even thinking a lot about now, is the issue of mental health. Now, post-COVID, there are three levels of intervention. Uh, and whilst the government one, I put it deliberately at the bottom, is because SMEs themselves can do a lot. Uh, the private sector will also do some, but I would like SMEs themselves to focus on their own intervention 
before we begin to rely on the externals. I'm aware of the time. I'm going to go a little bit rapidly, and I'm going to uh, leave the rest to when we do Q&A. Now, you need to innovate your business. That, that, for me, is a central message I want to leave with you. Let's not think only of intervention from the point of view of government. So if you are a fashion designer, for instance, I have seen a lot. Um, they begin to produce masks. See what is happening to uh, mile two, mile, mile 12 market. They are moving the market near your, your, your areas. I see a lot of people cannot go to hospitals today for so many reasons. And now we have e-doctors. We have event, event management. Yesterday, I attended an event online and I almost, almost could not imagine that it was online. It felt so real. I saw two or three of the banks offering people at home now to become their uh, trans agent, uh, money transfer agents. Schools are getting online. There's so many things you can do and you can innovate. If you're an event manager, most likely you are a very good project manager. How can you make that skills to be useful in this time? I have seen a rapid improvement in those that are in the logistic business. Yes, restaurants are closed, but kitchens remain open. People that are doing electronic and web services, some of my members, they are telling me that they are so busy, they are doing four times the turnover they used to make. Yet some of us are complaining at this time. People that are into digital and social marketing, the same thing. And those that are psychologists and mental health practitioners, this seems to be their time. E-businesses uh, is going to do well. In fact, they are doing well. And people that are involved in data services, all the telcos. So MTN recently declared the, um, their, their results. It's incredible what they have been able to do over this period. I will stop temporarily at this so that I can take a few questions before uh, Omar will take his turn. All right. Thank you so very much, Mr. Van Collin. You have taken us to school, as it were. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Bankale. You have taken us to school, as it were, with your concise and educative presentation on the interventions that are available and what we need to do. But please permit me to play the devil's advocate and ask, and I've got two questions from you on the back of your comments. So my first one is to ask, yes, you mentioned government intervention and you put it at number three. Um, let me to bring it forward um, because we've talked about some interventions and Mr. Omar Shakara will tell us in detail um, about the financials around it all. Um, in readiness for this conversation today, I did a little homework myself and um, with the help of my young friend, Osarame, thanks again, Osarame, we, we carried out a poll, a survey very much like the one you did, and we spoke to quite a few entrepreneurs and SME. Um, owners across the different sectors and the different um, industries. And we wanted to hear from the horse's mouth, as it were, and understand what their pain points were and what they think should be done. And the results were interesting, to say the least. And the decline that your poll has clearly shown, um, I'm not surprised at that number, other than a few people in healthcare, um, in logistics, in e commerce, everyone complained about the decline. In, in income. And so my first question to you, yes, there's intervention from the government. You said put it at the bottom of the pile, but let's start from there. Um, so that they've, they've made available loans that entrepreneurs can access, that um, SME owners can access after following due process. But is it just the loans that is what SMEs need? Is that the true intervention that's required at this time? What about tax breaks? What about saying to, um, to SME holders and entrepreneurs, you don't need to pay delay payments on taxes at this time because of this peculiar situation? You spoke to the fact that someone has said, or loads of people that you pulled had also confirmed 
some of them have been able to pay April salaries. But come May, June, July, September, your guess is as good as mine where salaries will come from. And if something isn't done, most of their staff will probably have to be let go and the labor market will receive new entrants, unfortunately, right? Yeah. What can government do, for instance? Can government perhaps say, because of this peculiar situation, we will subsidize the payment of salaries for your staff if you have been a good taxpayer, and I, let, permit me to just chip that in, and you have done your civic duty all this while. Now is the time when you need us, and this is what we can do. Remember, I'm just playing devil's advocate and just putting that out there. Um, what else can we do? I spoke to someone who says, my, my, my business is, um, is um, Forex, is, 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 is um, international trade, and I have to bring in a lot of goods. I can't get FX. I've got stuff at the courts that's incurring demurrage. Can the government perhaps waive these charges for this month of March and April when the midst of this pandemic that no one anticipated or saw come in? And what about the charges? Multiple layers of charges. The local government slaps you one. The state government slaps you another. FIRS is asking you to pay your taxes. So there are multiple layers. Is there something we can do for SMEs as well? Can there be some waiver, some rebate, some delay in payment to give them a breather? You mentioned yourself that cash is king at this time, right? And you need to have cash in hand. But where is the cash? What can government do to put a little back in the pocket of the SME owner? That's my first question. Okay, thank you very much, Binta. Um, that's one of the reasons why I said, let's not look at cash intervention. I'm going to put it within context. Okay. Um, if, you, if you hear 50 billion naira, it sounds like a lot of money, but the reality is that it's very, very small. Um, okay. to, today, we have uh, more than 40 million SMEs in Nigeria. Now, if you just assume that each of these MSMEs can access 5 million Naira, not even 10 million, just 5 million. Okay. That 50 billion will only go for 10,000 MSMEs, just 10,000, which is not even enough to scratch the sector at all. So the reality is that that intervention is nothing. And that's why I put it at number three, because I don't want people to focus on it. I want people to focus on what they can do for themselves, by themselves, to be able to be what we call COVID resilience. So that you can resist or you can align with pandemic and you can continue to thrive despite those adversities. That's number one. Number two, we need to look at the entire value chain. Let me give you some of the things that we feel that government should be doing beyond, beyond uh, uh, cash intervention. You talked about the tax, FRS. I am particularly appalled that when I read that yes, they will waive um, interest rates and everything on outstanding, but that is if you pay 100% by 31st of, 31st of May. Mm. Who is gonna make all that money and pay everything by the end of next month. Think about it. And mm -hmm. so, and if I make money, will I pay that first or I mm -hmm. will solve people, I will pay salaries so that they can ha and continue to maintain their families. We yeah. need to be empathetic at this time. There are some countries that are giving, whether it is free electricity, free water, free whatever, just to reduce the burden of the small businesses and indeed of households. So we need to okay. look at that. Some countries, they actually give tax reliefs or some you get tax credit. Some they actually put cash back into your ah. hand, right. back into your hand. But like you said, you have to be compliant yourself. So if Absolutely. you've not been paying taxes, if you've not been a good citizen, corporate mm -hmm. citizen, don't expect anything from government. That is a way in which they can begin to bring people back into the net but it is only good people, good businesses that they need to support. Okay. Now, in terms of Forex, the bad news is that it's going to get even worse. 
Oh dear. To start with, to start with, our major source of forex has been the oil, revenue Correct. from the oil. That has crashed. Today we are on below ten dollars, and not only that, there are some countries they are offering it at negative uh, below zero. Why? Because you cannot stop production of some of those wells. If you stop it, you will not be able to, 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 to restart them again. And so you need to keep producing or you slow down. At the end of the day, all those places taking it, they are filled up. So what do you do? And when that happened, already we are cutting budget because it's no longer realistic. It's, we are, we are, a lot of things. So there is no way if you are forex based, start thinking of something local. No matter how local, you have to do that. Otherwise, you will not be able to survive this. Thank you so very much, Mr. Vankole. And you've given me an entry into my next question. Um, we're clearly in VUCA times. I mean, no one could have seen what has hit the world coming. Um, it's a new world order. Business, life as we know it, will, will never ever be the same again. And so you, you alluded to that fact earlier on to say SMEs have to pivot, if you like, and redesign their models to not just survive, but thrive beyond this COVID-19. If it's not COVID-19, something else will come, God forbid, in a couple of years. Yeah. What can they do? I, I caught the news item the other day about the UK retailer, um, Primark, and how their monthly revenues dropped from £650 million pounds to zero. Zilch, nada. Why? Because they only sell from brick and mortar locations. And on the back of the pandemic, those have been shut down. So you go from 650 million pounds monthly to zero because you do not have an online strategy. Okay. Can any SME in Nigeria afford not to adapt, not to change, not to become nimble? It's the time to innovate or die. It goes without saying. So I must ask you, Sam, what else can our SMEs do? You've, you've mentioned a couple, the need to look back, backward integration. Um, there's so much more. So I've just used the example of Primark, for instance. Online marketing, is that the way to go? Um, are you open, is EDC open for one-on-one -on -one advisory? Can we come sit with you and, and, and get some pointers? Um, we've also had, you know, a few suggestions about renegotiating loans and more, and you know, and just getting not just loans, but even supply terms with your vendors and your suppliers. Everyone is in the same world that we're in. They understand what's happening, so I expect people to be reasonable and to come to the table, and we can renegotiate. You've got to rework a budget, obviously. Your sales projection, January or 31st of December, have gone out of the window. Clearly not feasible anymore. What else would you advise our SMEs to do? Because they have to remain in business. We're not just going to fold over or just you know, bend over backwards and die. There has to be something we can do. And we would like to hear from you as the expert. Okay, thank you again, uh, Binta. There is, there is no doubt in my mind uh, when I said there's going to be business model uh, rethinking, re-engineering. You have to do that if you, if you want to survive. There are three areas that we are seeing, and, and that is absolutely important for survival. And that's okay. one of the reasons why I put SMEs on at the, po at the top rather than, than, than at the bottom. The first one is business process transformation. Business process transformation. And okay. that precisely speaks to the point where even if you cannot convert everything you do to be digitally ready, okay. you must convert as much of it as possible. Okay. For instance, before the lockdown, one week before the lockdown, we locked ourselves down at EDC. And mm -hmm. we said to ourselves, everything that we're doing, we need to start to do everything online, even before the lockdown, mm -hmm. all right? And yeah. then, so we started to teach online. We started to, in fact, there were some that were difficult. We used to visit our members and all of a sudden we couldn't go again. So the guys came up with what they call virtual visits. 
And that virtual visit has been one of the resounding successes that we've had. Because we meet people, they are afraid, they are confused. And when they see us, when we show up, it gives them that hope that people talked about. And then we can help them to rethink about their businesses. So you don't even need to come physically. That can be done virtually. But you know, you have to begin to think of how do I take my business online or part of it online? The second thing is going to be around uh, value, I mean, supply chain renegotiation. That is very important. Absolutely. Whichever way we look at it, from the input to delivery, the entire value chain, you have to look at it and say to yourself, which one can I do sitting down in my location? Wow. Even when we are doing um, mobility and, and all the rest, or we are sitting down in one location, business okay. should not stop. So Absolutely. you have to begin to look at scenario planning. You have to think a lot of things to make sure that sitting in one place, businesses don't stop. And the last one of the three that I said is collaboration. Yeah. You will no longer be able to do everything by yourself again. And so, yes, I, I, I run a restaurant. Sometimes I can shut my restaurant, but the kitchen continues to go. However, for me to be able to reach my customers, it then means that I must collaborate with a delivery uh, company who can do this without any problem. We need to begin to think about, about collaboration. Even your supplies, you may not need to put everything together in one location. Gone are those days where we want to be all in all for everything. We will not have the cash to be able to do it. The resources will not be there. We need to begin to think of collaboration. Thank you, Binta. Thank you so very much. That was quite um, insightful and truly appreciated. Well, uh, our dear participants and registrants, you met Mr. Peter Bankole. He's still with us and we'll get the opportunity to ask questions as um, this webinar continues. At this time, we would now like to move over to our second speaker. But before then, please permit me to also remind you that you've got a question and answer box on your Zoom screen. And if you've got questions from Mr. Bankoli from the last conversation, you can put that in there and we will come to it in a short while. I mentioned to you that experts are in the house today and we're happy to have with us another person who is has a wealth of experience to share with us. He is the executive director in charge of SME Bank of Industry. He graduated with a second class upper in honors degree from Mamadou Bello University's area in 1985. He also obtained two master's degrees, not just one, in educational administration and international law and diplomacy from the University of Lagos. He's a licensed human resource professional, a member of the Society for Human Resources, a member of the Chartered Institute of Personnel Management, and a member of the Chartered Institute of Administration of Nigeria. He's a man of many letters. He had also previously served the military, the university community, commercial banks, and telecommunications before joining the Bank of Industry in 2005 as a senior manager and head of human resources. This gentleman rose to become a general manager in 2014 and is today the executive director of SME, Bank of Industry, BUI. Ladies and gentlemen, let me see those claps, e-claps, as we welcome Mr. Omar Shekharal to talk to us about the role of the BUI, about the interventions that they have, and all the financial information we will need to be able to access these interventions that are in place. Thank you, Mr. Omar, for joining us this afternoon. We will hand over to you now. Please take us home. Thank you very much, Binta. Good afternoon, ladies, and uh, the gentlemen that have the courage to join as well. Uh, <laughs> I follow my brother, uh, Mr. Bankole, to say that. Um, I've been introduced. My name is Shekharo Omar. Yes, currently the executive director, uh, SME in Bank of Industry. Now, Bank of Industry. It's important that uh, we say one or two things. I'll not bother you with uh, the issue of uh, mandate, mission, vision, and other things. What is important is what is today and what are we doing today? 
after today, what are we doing after today? Now, the first thing is for us to understand that Bank of Industry has been in existence for over 60 years. We started as Investment Company of Nigeria in 1959, became uh, Nigeria Industrial Development Bank in 1964, and from 2001 to date, we've been Bank of Industry. Now, we are part of the 15 uh, government parastatals or agencies that are under the Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment. We are 99% owned by the Central Bank of Nigeria and Federal Ministry of Finance. So what we are saying in essence is that we are a performing government institution. Um, what have we been doing? The question is, we've been transforming the Nigerian industrial sector from the beginning till now. And the intention is we should be able to do more, especially with the current situation we are in. Our business model is centered around three. One, we have the micro enterprises, we have the SME, and we have the large. Basically, they are defined by the loan value. Usually, the micro enterprises go for less than 10 million naira, while the SMEs go for after 10 million naira up to a billion naira loan. And anything over a billion naira goes to the large enterprises. And the concentration of this usually is under the SME. And that, is a, that explains why uh, in 2014, 2015, we had seven offices, but realizing the need to get very close to our customers, very close to the entrepreneurs, we decided to increase our number of offices. Today, we have 28 offices across the country, from seven to 28. And therefore, the SMEs have the largest concentration of customers as far as BOI is concerned. And that is why when, as the executive director SME, when I have headache, the managing director goes to hospital to look for, for, for doctors. Uh, otherwise, he will end up with a rotten stomach. I've spoken about uh, ownership, 100% owned, 99% owned between Central Bank of Nigeria and Federal Ministry of uh, Finance. Uh, shareholders funds, as of today, is over 300 billion, uh, which is about $981 million. Uh, total assets, we are talking of uh, over 1.3 trillion Naira, which is about 4.5 billion US dollars. Uh, we've been doing well, uh, as an institution. And the concern is, how do we create impact as against making interest? Agreed, you need to make interest for you to be able to remain in business and support those that you need to support. But our concern has always been creating impact. How do we support those that need us to employ more Nigerians, more Africans to do jobs so that they are financially also okay? Uh, and since this is WIMBY's concentration, uh, let me say a little bit about our gender desk. We established a gender desk at the head office and uh, the early directorate. And we have gender desk in the 28 offices we operate in Nigeria. This is to make sure that women businesses are supported 100% and they're encouraged. To date, we have supported over 496 women-owned businesses with a total disbursement of over 37 billion naira. Now, these are 100% businesses owned by women. And we classify them as owned by women if the shareholding is 51% and above, or the people that now make the management and staff of that organization, of that factory, of that institution, a majority women, we classify that as women as well. So as much as we can, we try to support women businesses because we know one, they are more in number, and number two, they pay loans better. Um, science has confirmed that, and a lot of studies have also confirmed that. And uh, these are the things we do. Now, going to COVID-19, for me, for the SMEs, it is really difficult to just start from COVID-19, because we need to understand that these are concerned entrepreneurs that are already in serious issues and serious businesses. Not only that, they also have difficulties. 
There's a difficulty of their unstructured nature. There's the difficulty of lack of credit history. There's the difficulty of non-availability of collateral. There's the difficulty of increased exposure to high cost of doing business. There's the difficulty of lack of trained manpower. There's the difficulty of lack of bankable applications. Now, so these are some of the things that this sector has been suffering from day one before the coming of COVID-19. So the coming of COVID-19 has only increased the suffering of these people, of these determined entrepreneurs. Now, but since we've been looking at these issues right from day one, it's important to look at now that COVID-19 is here, what is the bank doing to make sure that we encourage our customers, we encourage them, and the first thing we did was that, listen, let us reduce the interest rate. Bank of Industry is known to charge 10% for term loan and 12 up to 15% for working capital. Now this is to make sure that uh, the commercial banks are also uh, involved because they provide us with collateral. So we are in partnership. Uh, they provide us with bank guarantees and therefore, we are in partnership. As much as possible, we try to discourage uh, providing term loan as well as working capital. But where we have to, that is when we need to do that. So what we did was to crash our interest rate by 2%. Those that are, we are charging 10% have now come down to 8%. And for working capital that we are charging 13%, it has now come down to 11%. Starting from the first of this month to the end of 31st March 2021. For one whole year, we've reduced our interest rate by 2% to make it easy for people because we know how tough it is. So if you reduce the interest rate, it makes it easier for them to pay. We have also immediately deferred payment of all principal uh, payments any principal payment that is due for the next three months, we've deferred that. And what we do is, not only that we are deferring for three months, we are also going to look at it on case by case basis. The ones that will need more than three months, we will look at it and give them more than three months. If you need up to a year to come back to life, we'll give you, we'll defer, we'll give you that. So that we restructure your business in such a way that you remain in business. We know how tough it is and we are determined to go along with you. Uh, these are some of the things we've done. We have also implemented fully the presidential directive, fully the three months uh, deferment of principal payment, the, the three months in terms of uh, restructuring, we have done that and we will continue to support them, okay? Now, we have also implemented fully the CBN directive on all intervention funds. CBN crushed the interest rate by five to 5%. We have implemented that. And what we've done is to communicate to all concerned. Everybody that is involved, we've communicated to them. We have also implemented fully all directives from other fund owners. We have the intervention fund from the Nigerian Content Development and Management Board. The, the interest used to be 8%. The board said, listen, to make it easy for Nigerians that are in this business. Let us crash this interest to 6%. We have done that. So these are some of the palliatives that we've decided to do. Uh, but it's important for me to mention that uh, we have remained in business. Our service have been on. We work 24 hours and we contact our customers those 24 hours anytime we keep them, keep on advising them. We keep on talking to them. We know it's tough. We know it's tough, but it has not stopped us, especially the health sector that the federal government is uh, putting concentration on now because of what the challenges involved. We have not stopped supporting them. Three days ago, we disbursed over 3 billion naira to a health company so that they could provide what and what is required in this environment. So our services will continue to come in. We will continue to service them. We'll continue to talk to them. We'll continue to support them. Uh, these are some of the things we are doing. We have the support of the ministry. We have the support of the Central Bank of Nigeria. And we are working together 
to make it easier for them. There are funding that will come very soon. There are also other measures that are coming. We are involved in various meetings and uh, very soon there will be a lot of measures that will come in to assist them beyond the COVID-19. But as of today, COVID-19 has forced us to look inwards and say, what can we do? And part of what we've done is we've reduced our interest rate. We have also deferred interest payment on principal amount for the next three months. If we need to restructure so that these businesses come back to business and remain in business, we will do that. What is important is we are working with the government, we're a government institution, we believe in this country, especially women, we believe in what, what and what they can do, and we will continue to support them. Uh, I will stop here for questions and then uh, move on again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for, for sharing with us that very important information. Um, I'm sure I speak for Wimby's and all female SME owners and well, the general public as well. Uh, when we say a huge thank you um, for the good news about the gender desk, I mean, I thought that was excellent. People, we really should give the BOI, you know, a round of applause. Let's see those e claps for Mr. Omar and the BOI, um, you know, and thank you also for the compliment on women obviously being responsible borrowers and repaying on time. That's a proven fact. Um, you also mentioned that you, the rates, and you talked about quite a few of the reductions on the interest rate. Um, can, but can we be Oliver Twist and ask that you look at doing a bit more than 2%? 2% is commendable, uh, but we, we, I'm sure that we can do a whole lot more particularly because of this pandemic. And you know, you might not be able to answer us now, but it's something that we would appeal that you put on the table and look at 2% is good, but 5% could be better. Or even, you know, just what is applicable to the times and the seasons that we find ourselves in. But thank you, thank you for that good news. You've also shared with us about Bank of Industry. I didn't know it was 60 years old. I mean, I've been educated today. It's clearly a leading government agency and with the numbers that you you threw out obviously also very well funded one of your mandates like you you pointed out to us is the fact that you're supposed to um, provide funding for the smes and help them grow and scale and move to the next level um, in their business um, i've got a question and it's on the back of the general feedback um, that we've received about the cumbersome uh, tedious process of accessing these loans that you've talked about. Um, how does it work? I've got my sister who's in the fashion sector, for instance, who needs to access a loan. Does she just walk into one of your 28 offices nationwide? And what is the process? I mean, would, would appreciate some clarity around how this can be accessed. I would love to go to the bank tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow is a public holiday. On Monday, when, when you know we can move around, and, and be able to go in and, 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 and just get clarity as to what needs to be done. Um, what's the documentation? What will the BOI look out for that will ensure that my application you know, is seamless? Because there's this misconception I started to say about how the process is tedious, the process really isn't friendly, and how there's an inordinate, if you like, length of time between when the application is made and when funds are disbursed for the lucky, I think the number is 496 women businesses who have received it. For some, it took as long as seven to nine months before these funds came through. In a post-COVID world, that business will probably be dead before those funds come through. You will agree with me, there's a need to do things in a more timely manner. And then there's also the little matter about the collateral that's usually required and also the difficult conditions that you know the the SME owner has to scale or huddle to be able to access that. Uh, I, it would be great if you could dispel some of these misconceptions because I like to believe that's what they are based on what you said to us earlier on and just educate us all as to how we can ensure that there's a seamless process uh, and that gives us the desired outcome at the end of the day. Thank you very much. That's a, a tough one, but uh, uh, it's okay. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a system and uh, 
what is important for us is the fact that um, we are continuously improving on what we do. Let me take them one by one. One, you can walk into any of the offices in Bank of, in Bank of Industry and you'll be attended to promptly. Not only that, you will be guided. The issues we had before now were issues of capacity. You walk into a BOI office and you meet a boy or a young girl who has not had the necessary training, probably a fresher, and the person hands over checklist to you, that this is the checklist, look at it and then come back to us. For us, that alone is scary. It is not the way to do business. What we've done is, is we have changed our system completely. Nobody exactly. in BOI faces a customer without a minimum of six months training on customer service, checks and balances, what are the procedures, how do you address and how do you look at a customer. We see this business for us as our own business. When we go to present any project for approval, we take full responsibility that we are owners of this business. Mm -hmm. So we represent the ownership of that business and therefore we get approval and therefore implementing that becomes very easy. So there's ownership in every business we finance today. There's also ownership in when people walk in to see us. Most importantly, we realize the need to expand. Two things, one, we are in 28 states agreed, but are we well staffed to attend to everybody? The answer is no. So what we've done, two things. One, we went into partnership with what we call the business development partners, BDSBs. We had series of meetings with them. I'm happy to mention that uh, uh, Mr. Bankole's team has always been with us as well. So we have what we call business development partners that are all over the country. Currently, we have over 300 of them. They are experts. They help the SMEs to package them because they understand our language and they understand the language of the SMEs. They are in between. They are the bridge. So they, they, they help them that these are the things you need. And therefore, when we package you, we take you to BOI. You pay a token, sometimes as low as 10,000 Naira. BOI will pay the BDSP for bringing that business. When we eventually disburse to that business, we also pay the, DB, uh, the BDSP a success fee. So actually, it's BOI's creation to make sure that the SMEs are assisted, they mm -hmm. are helped, they are hand carried, and they are brought to us at a time when it will take probably a month or two to disburse money to them. Okay. Number two, because of how big Nigeria is, we are in partnership with SME-friendly commercial banks. We are also in partnership with microfinance banks. We do all lend into them, that we know you have the capacity to reach more hands. We know you are in every part of this country. There are more customers coming to you than they could go to anybody else. And you have their history. We will give you funds at a controlled rate that we know is favorable. We also want you to give to SMEs at a controlled rate. It should not exceed so-so amount. That way, we have also expanded our operations. I give you an example. Uh, recently, we went into partnership with Jaya's Bank and we gave them 3 billion naira. So give this to those that will come to you that will not want to go for, the, for, for interest banking. Those that are coming for non-interest banking, take 3 billion from us, work it out with them and make sure that they are assisted. This is to make sure that every aspect, every part of the, this is how it is. As far as system is concerned, we know that it is not perfect, but we are doing better than we were doing before. I told you we were in seven offices at one time. The person in North East, for example, the office is, was in Bauchi. The person in Taraba, Gombe, Borno, Yobe, and Adamawa have to all come to Bauchi wow. to talk to BOI. And we said, no, this is not fair on the SMEs.
is not fair on our customers. As of today, there's Bauchi office, there's Gombe office, there's Borno office, there's Adamao office, there's Taraba office. So you can see how close we are to our customers. And all this is to make sure that we are very close to them and we serve them well within a reasonable time. The question of collateral, it's a very interesting one. A lot of the MSMEs don't need more than 10 million Naira to start business. We've seen a lot of them. In BOI, we've made it so easy that you don't need to provide us with any collateral if you are taking anything less than 10 million Naira. From 10 million Naira uh, down, you can come with two guarantors, only uh, two guarantors, and 10% of the amount you are taking. Our belief is that any serious business-minded person in Nigeria today that says to you, I cannot get two guarantors, yeah. then it means there's a question already. Mm. There's a question there. So mm. these are some of the things that we've been doing. It is also important to mention that uh, we are in partnership with different organizations and 22 state governments. The whole idea is they, we can finance their SMEs in their various states at a low interest rate. And our interest usually is 10%. A state government brings in, let's say, 1 billion, and we join with another 1 billion. It is called matching fund. This 2 billion will be given to entrepreneurs within that state at 5%, because all state governments will say, for us, don't charge any interest. So it drops the interest from 10% to 5%. And sometimes the state governments will say, take a portion of this amount and use it as managed funds. Okay. Manage in the sense that we have identified entrepreneurs in our localities that we okay. know it will be difficult for them to have all the documentation that is required. Give them 100% from our fund because we believe in them. But monitor it and make sure that these funds come back. And therefore we do that. So there are quite a lot. Dangote, for example, we are in a five billion naira uh, matching fund with Dangote. Mm -hmm. For him, no interest. So it has crushed the interest to 5%. So awesome. these are some of the things we've been doing and to make sure that the issue of collateral does not uh, create a problem for them. Yeah. It's also important to say that we respect the commercial banks because 80 to 90% of these customers have been their customers before coming to us. And therefore, they ride on the back, the back of the commercial banks and the banks provide, them, provide us with bank guarantees. What is important here is that I know this customer, he has been my customer for 20 years. Okay. His funds come to us because we don't have, part of our mandate is not to take any deposits. So money does not come to us directly. It has to come through the commercial banks. So they said to us, listen, we know this customer. He needs 2 billion from you, BOI, okay? Or he needs 500 million. We will guarantee that 500 million, give him. So we pass the money to the commercial bank and it goes to the customer. This is because they have the history and they want to support the customers. So it is very easy. The issue of collateral should not be an issue because there are so many ways you can now collateralize your, your request. The, 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 the CBN uh, a collateral system that is now on, that so many commercial banks are benefiting. We are also doing that. Uh, the, mob the, the, the mobile commercial, I mean, collaterals that are on. We are also encouraging our staff to encourage customers to come. Excellent. So these are some of the things we do. And as far as we are concerned, the business is doing well. We are encouraging uh, customers. We are supporting them. SME alone, last year, we disbursed close to 50 billion to SMEs. This year, except for the COVID-19 issue, we are looking at about 70 billion to disburse to SMEs. Generally, the bank is doing well. And you also note that we also have been rated by international agencies, Moody's, Fitch, and locally by Augusto and Co. Now, we have to maintain that because riding at the back of that, 
two years ago, we got $750 million from international banks anchored by AfriExim. This year, just before the coming of COVID, we brought in 1 billion euros from syndicated banks. Now, these funds come with their conditions. And therefore, as much as possible, we try to give it to those that will benefit from these funds. But you look at the value chain. Every large enterprise business has its suppliers as SMEs. And therefore, the value chain is such that the SMEs benefit from every large enterprise business we support. And that is why we're saying that people should not get scared. Uh, BOI is changing in terms of our activities. I, I also mentioned that uh, we do a lot of things online today. Uh, okay. People will apply and then we, 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 we respect that and we make sure that we do business with you. i give you one example. When we started uh, marching fund with Kaduna State Government, it couldn't go anywhere. Now, RFI came, audited it and said, how do we make it better? We said, the best thing is let's have a triangle of success. You have Kaduna State Government, one end, you have Kaduna Business School and you have Bank of Industry. We advertise online, people will apply, and you will see your application going. You will go in for capacity building with Kaduna Business School, which is what we also do with uh, Lagos Business School and others. After a while, you uh, assess. And the whole thing is, it's not a daily classroom affair. It is classroom and practical. If you want to be a carpenter, you are taken to a, a, a manufacturer and you understand how the going, I mean, how the business goes on. And then you grow with that in mind. At the end of it, only those that are successful and they have shown interest are granted those loans. I can tell you that we have exhausted the 1 billion Naira within a very short period of time. And if not for COVID-19, more money would have come from Kaduna State Government and would have wow. matched. Wow. Two weeks ago, Borno State Government brought in 500 million. We have matched that with another 500 million. And we've been working online. By next week, we'll start disbursing to their entrepreneurs. So these are some of the things we do as an institution to make sure that every angle of this country is covered, every willing entrepreneur is supported, and we will go beyond the limits to make sure that you succeed because your success is our success. I mentioned earlier on that uh, when we go to present, we present on behalf of you, that this is our business. And therefore we cannot afford to, to, to let it fail. Thank you. I hope Thank I've you answered. so very much, Mr. Omar. Thank you. Thank you. You have done an excellent job in correcting some of these misconceptions that have been floating around. And it's, it's been wonderful it, uh, music to my ears to hear about all this, you know, intervention funds that are coming through and the partnership with the state government. I like the phrase triangle of success, and I hope that will be duplicated with other state governments as well. Um, and interesting to know, and it's great news to receive the fact that you only need two guarantors and 10% um, of the loan amount you're requesting for if the amount you're seeking to access from the DOI is 10 million and below. Is that correct, sir? Correct, yes. Fantastic. So come Monday, my sister in the fashion industry. Let, let, let me also about... say, let, let, let me say this. The 10% okay. that you are keeping with us is kept with our microfinance bank and it yields oh. interest for you every day until when you finish paying and you come for your money. So wow. it's a different saving that we are doing for you. We are wow. now asking the entrepreneurs that listen, you also need to do some savings. No, and they bring the 10%, we'll keep it for you. It is also yeah. interesting to state that someone who wants to take your 10 million mm. does not have 10%, does not mm. have two guarantors. You mm. know that that business is uh, heading somewhere mm. else. Absolutely. And you know, because I, I, I'm sorry to say this, because we're a government institution, but operating mm. differently. Mm. Every person that comes to us, in most cases, People believe that, uh, let me go and take my share. 
<laughs> if they allowed that to happen, we would have been dead a long time ago. Right. Oh, I know. I totally agree with you, sir. Okay. Thank you so very much for that clarification. So there you have it, our participants. Um, there's so much available, $750 million, 1 billion euros. Like I said, music to my ears. And the opportunity exists for you to access them when you follow due process. I have loads of questions for you as well, Mr. Omar, but this is about our registrants and our participants and our online viewers. And so we would like to move um, very quickly to the questions. There's so many questions that we've got already. And so I would move to the questions. Some of them are for Mr. Ban Kole, and some are for you, Mr. Omar. We would um, just um, go through the questions and we will crave your indulgence to help us respond to them. Um, it was something that I saw that I thought was interesting. Okay, and I'll take this now. It's from Lande, and Lande is asking, given the need to upgrade our healthcare facilities going forward, this is an opportunity to push clean energy as a solution. Will BOI look to a special green energy fund for supporting renewable energy solutions in healthcare? And so that's a question for you, Mr. Omar. We'll start with you, you have the floor. Oh, thank you very much. Um, well, this is very interesting for me because two things. One, our healthcare is one of uh, the areas that we are doing very well and very supportive. We're talking in terms of billions that have been disbursed to so many. Um, without mentioning names, every healthcare uh, organization in this country that is producing has BOI behind it. 80% of them, they have BOI, BOI support. Number two, green energy. You know, about uh, six, seven years ago, we went into partnership with UNDP on solar energy. And we had pilot studies. We also were able to lighten up some villages that for the next 200 years, they are not likely to be on the grid. Now, after the end of that exercise with the NDP, we established a department, Renewable Energy Department under the Large Enterprises Group. And currently, that group is doing very well. And we are encouraging people to come in for that. In fact, if not for the little hitches we have now, what do we intend doing is most of our offices will be on renewable energy. Our second tower that is under construction would have been 30% renewable energy powered. But we, we change the model a little, a little bit. But what I'm saying is that, yes, you can walk into BOI office and these are areas that we are already supporting. We are doing very well and we'll continue to support. Healthcare, we are doing very well. We've disbursed billions in that area. And like I said, just three days ago, we disbursed 2.3 billion to a company that is into healthcare. At this time, at this time, we did everything online and disbursement was done, 2.3 billion to support them. In terms of green energy, you are welcome anytime. We have a table, a desk, a group that handles that. And in every office of BOI, such activities are replicated. So you're welcome anytime. Thank you so very much, Mr. Omar. And on the back of that, there's a full on question. Um, and I, I guess essentially it's an advice to say, BOI should run more online campaigns to raise awareness to SMEs about the availability of financing. So a lot of SMEs apparently don't know what they know today and what you have shared with us on this webinar. Um, and they don't approach the banks because they believe the banks will ask for collateral. It's great to know that collateral is not needed and that you know, they're just learning this today. So just a, a quick advice to say, BOI needs to do a whole lot more about putting that information out there so that people are aware of what is available and the process of accessing it. Uh, I assure Mr. you that- Mr. Uh, I have a couple of- Okay, great. We will do that. What is important is that we have people online that are listening and taking note. Every issue that is raised here today and answered or unanswered will be taken care of. 
this is an area we feel we should do and we'll do more. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mr. Omar. Okay. Mr. Bankale, a few questions on innovation and on your earlier conversation with, with everyone. So a question here from Sharon is to say, for someone who is into buying and selling mini importation, what innovative actions can the person take? And very similar to that, I'll just quickly also just add this one, is for someone who's asking to say, are there any, um, what does LBS do to support young graduates or mentor young graduates? Is there any support to them? And this is from Omar Lera. Mr. Bankale. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I believe I already answered the lady that asked about buying and selling. Uh, okay. Unless you add value, that is not sustainable uh, for two reasons. One, the issue of Forex, which is now in limited supply or will continue to be a limited su supply. But more importantly, uh, because it depends on also what you are buying and what you are selling. Uh, because of lower okay. disposable income, people are going to shift their priorities and that may not be one. You use the example of uh, Primax in the UK. It's not so much yeah. that they, they only have physical spaces. The fact is that in moments like this, um, certain non-essential products are not the first you want to run to. You want to be able to buy food to eat. So if you are not in that line of business, sorry. We want to be able to buy your medicines. If you are not there, sorry. So people will reparatorize what they buy. And if you are not in that line, sorry, it's not going to happen. That, that's the long and short of it. For young graduates, for young businesses, um, I mean, sorry, young graduates, I'm aware that uh, once a year, uh, LBS do have um, a program that brings young graduates together, and then they train them, and then they expose them to uh, people that are already established in the, in the uh, community. So that way, they could be mentored. Yeah. That is already running even before COVID. Fantastic. So, but there are, uh, there are a couple of questions that I highlighted that I want to, to speak to directly uh, because okay. they occurred several times. So there are three of them that I will quickly <laughs> speak to. The first one is around event planning. And people are saying, how can you plan events uh, when everywhere is locked down? Yesterday, I attended a one hour a birthday celebration online. And I almost, in fact, I couldn't believe it because it felt so real. People are beginning to be very creative around what they do. And so what did these people do? The guy that was celebrating birthday, uh, I think there was an arrangement with the wife and the wife gave all the contact points of the people. Now, after wow. that, after that uh, event, I started to imagine how they could make it even better. We enjoyed it, it was good, but I could make it better. One, imagine if we were celebrating your birthday, Binta, and yes. as an event planner, I was able to trace your roots, okay. where you come from, I trace your secondary school, I trace a lot of stuff, and I bring those people onto that conversation during that online. It will be like, wow. this is your life. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you will, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Then it also means that some of your friends that might have traveled out, I can link up with them. I can bring all of that together. Somebody will see value in that and they will pay for it. That for me is the point. But it is just the way in which we have to think about it. We don't need to design the physical space to look beautiful anymore. What we need to design is to design the experience that mm. will be received. I called yeah. the guy this morning and he was like, wow, you guys wow. did a wonderful <laughs> job, wow. And it was nothing. You know, wow. we got a cake <laughs> delivered to this guy at the point. Wow. We got everybody to log in with studio names. Yeah. And, and, and then because the guy was my fa facilitator, he thought he was going to teach with me online. And so we, we logged in. <laughs> We put him in a waiting room until everybody changed their names into a oh. studio name. 
And uh -huh. by the time he came in, he started seeing the video. He was seeing, they were like, what are these guys doing in my class? And, and they started opening the video. It was incredible. Uh -huh. It was lovely. Uh -huh. It's about experience. Let Absolutely. people get experience. That's one. The second one around manufacturing. People say it's, it's physical, it's this. It is true. But there is now a new thinking in the world today. Everybody seems to have faced China. You know, there is an adage, we all slept and we're all facing China. Now <laughs> people have woken up and they say, sorry, we can't all face China sleeping anymore. We have to look for a new order. And people are going to be looking for different manufacturing uh, communities. And Africa, Nigeria, has that possibilities. Because of the lower disposable incomes today, we are going to see Nigeria as being competitive to be able to receive uh, our, uh, to position ourselves as a manufacturing hub. Of course, there will be problems, but we can surmount those problems. Problems can come from the way of maybe uh, power, this and that, but those investments can be made because they were made in other cities. But the competition will not just be with Africa, but with other developing economies. So we need to think about that. But it is possible. And then the it last one, but the last one around beauty services. It is true. I, I mean, the last place you want to go today is to go for maybe either gym or you want to go and do massage and things like that. But then it's not going to work like that forever. There will be some procedures that will be put in place. Home services will happen. But we need to be able to rapidly do um, a COVID test or whatever test so that within maybe five, 10 minutes, like the one that is being done in um, Senegal for less than, for about a dollar. If I yeah. can do that, even if you are providing me any home services, whether it is cleaning, whatever, I will test you before you come into my, into my house. And once mm -hmm. I know you are not, I mean, you are negative, then I can mm -hmm. let you in. So there will be business in that area and you can continue to do uh, your, your business. Then eventually people will go back to your spa and they, you, you have to prove to them that you are negative before you can handle them both ways. So these things are possible. It's just that we need to take a pause at this time for maybe a few weeks and after that to rethink about how we re-engineered our processes. That's all. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Bonkale. That was very useful to know. Um, and and, it's, and I, I, I love the example of your friend and, and the birthday celebration. And I was just thinking in my head, the only thing probably missing was the food and the drink. But uh, I let me tell you, no, yeah, we, had, we had food. I, no, 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 we did. Let me tell you, we asked everybody to have their drinks. So by wow. the time we got to the toast, we all opened our bottle, everybody, you know, did cheers. And then we were drinking, exactly, in, in that's one. <laughs> then the second one was that there were so many other games that we played in wow. that short period. It was fantastic. Wow. And then the wow. cake, they had their own cake delivered. The guy cut the wow. cake and then somebody talked about it. And, uh, you know, if you had cake, bring your cake and eat. All right. It was yeah. a cheaper way <laughs> to even celebrate it. Excellent. Thank you so very much. And we're taking a cue from there as well. And maybe I'll just ask this question on the back of that. Someone says, I work with a land and investment organization. You've just talked about, uh, about creativity and, and you know, this new um, um, idea about how to celebrate online. And this person is looking for ideas. Works with a land and investment organization. Does not know how to convince investors in this pandemic period because no one is forthcoming. What would you advise this lady, Christiana, Mr. Bancoli? I have a couple of questions to follow for Mr. Omar. <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, um, I was in another um, webinar this morning and, and something of this nature came up. And we, we came to a conclusion, first of all, that not all businesses can be re-engineered. Not okay. all. Uh, naturally, some will have to to die, if that's the word I would say. They, they have to, you just have to move on to something else. Uh, okay. But there are, there are things that you, there are some skill sets that you have. It is those okay. skill sets that you must take with you, either to start a new business or to start something completely different. Let me give you an example. 
One, for those in the event planning business, and I keep using this because it's the easiest one we can all relate with. Mm -hmm. One of the key skill set that they have is project management. Mm -hmm. And there is no business in this world that does not require project management, whether it is being done physically or online. And so mm -hmm. those guys are way ahead of us in think, so long as they can think, they can redirect that skill set and they will make money from it. That's what mm -hmm. I would say. Now, if you are in land and investment, there are some skill sets that you have built. You probably have a nose for seeing things ahead of people. Okay. So it may be this land uh, in, in the next five years, that's when development will come. That's when this will do you then begin to think about that. It's a skill set that not everybody will have. What you need to do is how do we move that skill set and use it in a, in a different context? And it may not be with land anymore. That's the point I would just make. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Van uh, Mr. Omar, quite a few questions relating to accessing the loan from BOI. And um, someone here is also asking, is there anything in place for the aviation industry? And, and he's talking, or she is talking specifically to the travel agents in Nigeria. And, you know, that, that, that's just a short question. But on the back of that as well, um, are many appeals, I would term them, because a lot of them are not questions, to say um, there's still a lot of issues with the process at BOI. You have addressed that already, but I still have quite a few people asking those questions. So I'll just like you to reassure our audience as to what has, and or give us an assurance that indeed this, the issues have been taken care of and it is not business as usual going forward. And then the other question, again, for BOI, um, the interventions that you've mentioned and Yin Kashulebo is asking, are they easily accessible? Okay, you answered that, but like I said, quite a few people how can we simplify the process? How can we help women without collateral? What is on ground to do that? So I just thought I'll throw that to you and just have you. Possibly some of these people joined us after you had spoken, but please just reassure us about the process at BOI and the ease of access for entrepreneurs and SME owners. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is question three. Uh, first, let me start with aviation. You know, there have been the Aviation Intervention Fund from CBN, uh, but this was to help those that are into the real uh, services of uh, maintenance and other things of the aircrafts. And these interventions usually come through the various commercial banks where these customers have been working with and where they've taken funds from. Number two, travel agents. These are services, okay? I am certain that in today's BOI, when we sit together with whoever is the prospective customer here in this field, we will find a way. Because we have expanded our operations to cover areas that hitherto we've not been doing. Uh, the only thing that we know we don't do today, for example, is putting a structure, buildings for you. Because there are other government institutions that have responsibility to do that. Okay. But from the time, if you're building a hotel, for example, you finish the structure and you need windows, you need furniture, you need other things, BOI will come in, including providing you with lifts. So there are so many areas that BOI today can come in to intervene, to bridge the gap. Okay. Most importantly, we know that a lot of businesses cannot be financed by commercial banks, even okay. if they want to finance these businesses. The person taking these funds from a commercial bank, can he afford the interest rate? Hmm. Which is why in the first place, DOI has been established to make sure that we provide funding at a very cheap rate to industrialize the country. So these are some of the areas that I think it's coming in to BOI or talking to our business partners will resolve these issues as against think thinking that it cannot happen. Number two, the issue of our processes, I had earlier mentioned that if you had seven offices at one time for 56 years of your existence, you existed with seven offices serving the same country, 
Now, in the last four or five years, you have expanded your offices from seven to 28. It says a lot that we are very close to our business partners. We are very close to Nigerians. We are very close to the entrepreneurs. Not only that, we have also gone beyond that to establish a relationship with what we call the business development partners. They are in every town and village and their responsibility is to help in packaging the business models and other things for these entrepreneurs that may not have the knowledge. And they may not want to go to start looking for capacity building when it will cost them funds. We have also engaged the likes of Lagos Business School and others to run capacity building at different parts of this country for NYSC members, we're in partnership with NYSC, Every call, we provide capacity building and we provide funding for those that are thinking of becoming entrepreneurs. We engage consultants to train them. And without any collateral, the only collateral you have is your certificate, which NYSC will keep. You take two million, go and do your business. The day you finish paying, you go to NYSC with your clearance and they give you a certificate. So these are so many, there are so many things. We run programs for thousands with... Uh, uh, Lagos Business School, ESP, uh, for the youth, and it was an interesting program. We have disbursed over a billion naira to young entrepreneurs through this process. So the issue of saying, oh, the, the system, it's still cumbersome, it is still difficult, is the thinking of yesterday. Today, today's BOI is different. You can reach anybody. Someone looking for a loan of one million naira will call me at 12 midnight and I will pick. Say, Omar, I have supply, I have given this to, to uh, I have applied. And I will say, you don't need to talk to me. It will come to me. Somebody will call you 6 a.m. that my disbursement uh, has been waiting. And you tell the person that we've disbursed to you 48 years ago, I mean, 48 months, uh, hours ago. And the person will be shocked that, oh, I've not even been contacted. Let me check. And the person will call you after five minutes. Oh, thank you. I didn't know. So there are so many things we are doing to make sure that we make it easy for, for them. Okay. That's uh, good. To we, thank we you. We appreciate their complaints uh, because okay. you can only do better. You okay. can only do better if people tell you the gaps. Absolutely. Uh, the third, we also insist on capacity building because the key to everlasting power while alive is knowledge. If you don't have knowledge of what you are doing, no matter the funding, you will not succeed. But if you have knowledge of what you want to do, what you want to do, what you want to produce, then it will be easier because we have seen cases where someone comes to you, I need a hundred million. By the time you finish your discussions with the person, he says to you, I can do with 25 million. I don't need the balance of 75 million now. I can grow over time. So knowledge is very key. It's important. And that is why we engage the likes of Peter Bancoli in our activities to make sure that people have the required knowledge and understanding of even the business they want to go in or the business they want to expand. That way, the funding will come easy and it will be utilized, return. The beauty of micro lending is that it has the capacity to replicate itself. When you take and it comes back, another person takes, it comes back, another person yeah. takes. But if people take and it does not come back, we'll get to a level where nobody will get. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Omar. And while you were speaking a short while ago, even though this is not meant to belabor the point, um, you talked about the collateral and, um, you know, and the process that you utilize in, in many instances. Question here from Mr. Adeyemi is, why is BOI not using the National Collateral Registry to ease the burden of the requirement for security from SMEs? Um, so there's a National, national Collateral Registry um, that's, that's, that's um, effective um, as much as possible or to the best of our knowledge. But that there's no, that it looks like BOI and this registry aren't seeing each other, for want of a better word. Isn't there some way we can streamline that process so that, you know, that this SME doesn't then have to go through that, you know, tedious process again of submitting this and submitting that? Is there somewhere you're working 
with the National Collateral Registry? Well, uh, thank you. The Nash, it's a very simple question. The National Collateral Registry provides you or gives you an opportunity to use the items you have, if it's a car or anything, to serve as collateral for your loan. Because these are things people have. And I can tell you that between August and September last year, we engaged every staff of Bank of Industry for a capacity building with CBN and other relevant organizations to make sure that they understand how to use that. So it is open and we've started using it. People are free. Meet any of our BDSPs, meet any of our state offices, they will confirm to you that yes, we can use that as collateral for you to have your loan. Just the important thing is that just know that once it is registered, it is registered. You cannot use it in another place. In another place. Commercial banks are engaged in it, so why can't BOI be engaged in it? We are 100% in it, and we will encourage you to come for it. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Mr. Bankole, I know you have a couple of questions that are directed at you. You have indicated you would like to respond to. You have the floor. Please proceed. Um, sorry, I don't know which one and which one anymore. There, there seems to be like tons, and I'm answering some <laughs> online, so I'm already... So if you can just refresh a couple that you like, and then we will go about it. We can do that, absolutely. Um, someone here is asking, and I wanted to be sure, um, okay, your advice for brick and mortar businesses, I think we're taking that, right? Okay. What is your advice for brick and mortar businesses like cinemas and family entertainment centers where the equipment is capital intensive, how do you suggest we move forward? Um, going digital is a long-term option, assuming there are products. So to start with, how do we even scale up? Okay, well, you see the way things work, it's around your business model. Um, physical spaces, everything may be important. And I will use the last um, one of the examples in our network, um, BAP, that is, um, I can't remember the full, meaning, uh, full name anymore, but they, they produce the Fela and the, the Terra Culture people. So, Bolanle uh, or St. Peter's, exactly, BAP, Bolanle or St. Peter's. Uh, you will notice that she has been very, very aggressive in promoting uh, state screens and, th and th this is a very physical stuff. And then in the last uh, couple of weeks during this lockdown, what has she done? She has now been able to uh, provide this as entertainment in-house during lockdown on Sunday. So 7 p.m. Uh, two weeks ago, we watched uh, the Fela and the Queens. Uh, last Sunday, we watched uh, Moremi. And slowly, these are things that she had before and had been recorded. But she is now using it to reposition herself and to be able to market the kinds of things that she does. So that when the space opens up, she is already there in the face of everybody. You needed to have seen the comments and the compliments that went with those uh, uh, showing uh, last two Sundays. So yes, when, when the cinemas open, perhaps we're going to be having 50% filled up. It is possible because of social distancing. But then, which one do you go to? It is the one that has been in your face or faces that you will go to. This is how to do it. However, it is important for us to know that brick and mortar alone will not do it anymore. We have to use a blended approach. And depending on the one the customer is comfortable with, then the customer will go. So while some will still choose to go, some will prefer to... I was just talking about even um, chefs. You will now begin to have chefs on hire. They will come home to prepare food for birthdays rather than, uh, you know, throwing a big party. And then you will have some very specialized designer type uh, <laughs> events. Uh, you are going to see, it's going to come up. You just have yeah. to be creative about those things. But brick and mortar, it's, it's, it's um, if nothing else, it's 50% done. Absolutely. Look Thank at you, what Netflix is able Net to do now, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Bankole. We've got another 15 minutes for the questions and answers, so please keep them coming. And I have a couple here, and Mr. Omar, I have this one for you. It's a very simple one. Can NGOs access the funds, the BOI funds? NGOs, um, no. BOI funds are meant to help entrepreneurs. And okay. they are cheaper funds, okay? Yes. However, if you have a program that if you are engaged in developing entrepreneurs, then okay. we can partner. You can develop them to a certain level and then we can provide the funding. But as to come and establish an office as an NGO and then take loan from BOI, then we are not, we are running away from our mandate of industrializing the country. Okay? So, but okay. simply put, develop capacity in youth, develop capacity in women, develop capacity in entrepreneurs across the country, come to us, we can partner and provide the funding. Excellent, thank you so very much. Um, another simple question um, to the point about the 10 million that can be accessed um, with two renters. When the required or the needed fund is more than 10 million Naira, can the purchase order, if it was a purchase order, be used as the collateral? Amaka John is asking. Mr. Omar? Um, no, you see, the beauty of granting any loan is in its ability to pay at a given time, okay? That's one. Number two, your capacity to work with what is given to you based on your need at that time, okay? Mm. So if you go beyond 10 million and we give you what is for 10 million, then we ask you to provide collateral. Then now it beats the purpose for this because a lot of people will cut corners. What we want is the person that has the capacity to take 10 million and below, come and take 10 million and below. We will support you and you don't need collateral. The person that requires more than 10 million, it means their capacity to produce is higher Okay. In terms of their equity contribution is higher and therefore it is easier for them to provide the collateral that is needed and the loan is granted. Remember, from the beginning of survey to disbursement to pay back, we remain with the customer. So it is in our own interest that we guide the customer properly. If you don't need more than 10 million, you don't need more than 10 million. If you need more than 10 million, then we know you need more than 10 million. But okay. can we start, if you have in mind to do three lines at a go, we'll advise you, no, do one line. Then you can grow over time. After a year or two, we see the need that you have the market, you have the capacity. Then you, we can say to you, without you asking, we strongly believe that you need more. We will work it out for you so that you have, you know, your capacity expanded. So these are the things. The whole thing is in truth. Are we ready to support you? In truth, are you ready to come for what is required with a mind of pain, with a mind of engaging more Nigerians in your factory so that they have something to do, with a mind of developing others so that tomorrow they also become entrepreneurs themselves? If the two sides believe in doing this, it will be easier for us to move forward. And remember, you can use the, the National Collateral Registry now, okay? And for BOI, we have gone beyond the limits, to be honest. Before now, we take collaterals only from state capitals. But now we have gone beyond that to say, listen, what, where are the commercial cities in a particular state that we know a collateral can sell, can be useful, okay? The purpose of all these loans is for you to be able to pay from, the generate, from what the business is generating. Collateral is the last part. Nobody wants to take your house, but okay. it's just that in the event that there's an issue, there's something to fall back on. But the whole thing is, can the business continue to pay the loan? 
until when the loan is over. Now we can take collateral in Bauchi from Azari, we can take from Misa, we can take from, from, from Jamaari. Now, because we know these are commercial towns and the people doing these businesses are genuine people that we know, they are only providing these collaterals as a backup. They want to pay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Omar. That's good to know. Um, two quick questions for you and I'll put them together. Um, are there specific businesses that can access these loans and is there a cap to the funds? And for so this person asking, or don't worry, wanting to know, can a company in coal mining, for instance, access a term loan of up to 400 million? And on the back of that, I'll tack this on. And the question is, is there any special consideration for healthcare? So retail pharmacists, for instance, is there a special consideration in view of the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic and you know the health issue is a, is a, is a key or a burning point? Are there special considerations? And so maybe the question really is, is there an exclusive list? Do we have a checklist of companies or sectors or industries that can access this fund and no further? Or is it open to all and sundry? Can you just confirm that for us? There was quite a few people that asked the same question. Okay, great. Uh, you know, you can't say there is no end to anything, okay? I'd earlier mentioned that we can't finance buildings because there is another institution, a government institution that is doing that. We can finance roads because there's a government institution, infrastructure bank that is doing that. There's the Federal Mortgage Bank. They, we are established to perform different functions. But if you are in coal mining and others, you don't need to ask if you can come for 400 million. You can come for billions so long as you can prove that we can support you and you have the capacity. Okay. So many businesses. The issue of healthcare is so large today that people have to think inwards and see what we can do. I re remember I said that for every large enterprise that we support, you have chains of uh, SMEs that follow. Nothing stops us from financing pharmacists that have a chain with a producer that we have financed. It's all a question of looking at it carefully, looking at where the gaps are and how can you do the best you can to support them. This country needs all of us and it requires us to think beyond the normal thinking. We should go beyond the normal cycle of, oh, these are the businesses we can support, these are the businesses we cannot support. We are open and we can do quite a lot. The bank of industry of today, I, I keep on saying, we are very lucky bank. From 2001, when Dr. Larry Osafiana is, became the MD, a, an excellent development banker, recognized world over. He served for four years, handed over to Evelyn Oputu, a banker herself and an entrepreneur who brought the two together. She served for eight years. Rashid Ola Olua came a young commercial banker with a mind of creating a system that should work by itself. After that, you have Olukayo Depita, who has been a man, uh, who, who was earlier managing director of different banks before leaving to say, I want to serve God. Now the government brought him. And in our discussions, he always says, I'm here to serve. Now, these are excellent bankers in our board today. Apart from an excellent chairman that we have, we have three different former managing directors of banks on that board. So we are fully guided. We are working together with the ministry. We're working together with CBN, right? Fantastic ministers in the Ministry of Industry, fantastic support from CBN, wonderful support from Federal Ministry of Finance Incorporated. So, and they are on our board. And we are always challenged. How can we do it differently? How can we do it differently? You would have noticed that the Vice President, His Excellency, always visit the MSME clinics. And the whole idea is how do we make it easy for the SMEs? Of recent, if not for COVID, we would have gone to commission a shared facility in Benway State. We have one in Ibadan, we have one in Bauchi, there's one now in Benway, there's one coming up in the East is to make it easy for the entrepreneurs. 
with a shared facility, you don't bother about power, you don't bother about road, you don't bother about water. You carry your own equipment, the equipment are there. You go and produce at a minimized rate. And you find that there's, there's a chain already. As you're producing, you're producing for someone who is within the shared facility. So you are providing someone with the, the raw materials. And things are made easy for SMEs. So these are some of the things that we are challenged every day. Like I said, we are in a very unique position. Okay. Owned Thank by you. CBN and okay. Federal Ministry of Finance, supervised by the Federal Ministry of Industry. You can never have a room to rest and there's no gap. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mr. Omar. Uh, um, that's truly really appreciated. So our, our listeners, you heard that. There's no, um, no exclusion list, if you like, and you just need to access the BOI and they'll be able to confirm to you what is doable and what isn't. A few people have asked, I mean, are there loans for creative arts such as book writing and publishing and the costs that go with it? Someone else wants to know, how can we recognize the BOI partners? Um, you know, so I'm sure that if we're able to go on the BOI website, we'll be able to get this information and, and, and make an informed decision. Mr. Bankale, I'll come to you and I've got a couple that I'd like you to deal with very quickly. Um, what, is, what is the fate of FinTech, especially digital saving and investment post COVID-19? What is the fate of FinTech, especially digital saving and investment post COVID-19? The, the follow on question, is this the right time to venture into developing these platforms? That's question one. Another question was to say, Mr. Bankale, can you share your views about accessing a loan at this point in time? Will it be a smart move to take a loan for business at this point in time? Um, and in, in, for what advice would you also give for people in photography, makeup artists? Do you have any insights you'd like to share? So I've, I've given you a, a, a triple. <laughs> okay, I, I actually have uh, quite a lot. And uh, let me start with the one you didn't ask, which is a lady in HR. And she has been, you know, writing even in the chat box saying, okay. take my question. <laughs> anyway, so that's Dockers, no problem. So now for Dockers, um, HR consulting, the requirements are different at this time. And so one of the things that you will be looking for is that are these people that you are recruiting, are they, um, are they online ready? Unlike before, where you are looking for different skill sets. So yes, they may have those skill sets, but they must be able to know how do they do meetings on Teams, on Zoom, on WebEx, all kinds of stuff. That is a skill set that is now mandatory. If you don't know how to do it, sorry, you cannot collect. You have to also know how do we collaborate online. Those are different skill sets you are going to be looking for when you are doing your recruiting. And when people know that you are able to get those type of people, yes, they will link up with you and there will be no problem. On the guy, FinTechs is a fantastic time. Honestly speaking, um, you can save, you can transfer money, you can do all kinds of stuff. It's a good time. But be careful because systems must be properly established. You must be able to link well with the financial institutions. You must also be able to make sure that you are within the framework of regulatory systems so that you don't come down, uh, they don't come hard on you. Once you can do all of this, hey, you are good to go. I have people that are doing um, you know, social lending. So from your, from your Facebook account, they can determine whether you are a good, they can lend to you or not. Is as good as that, and they do it in, in, in quick succession. For the photography, you just have to think differently. You know, before you would have to go there, take the pictures and all of that, people are doing things differently these days. And the, the event that I, I, I talked to you about yesterday, I was just thinking that we had an MC, and the MC really made the whole one hour to be very lively and exciting. But I said to myself, we needed a photographer. How can, you, how can you do photography in a virtual space? Hmm. And that's what not you have to crack. Once you hmm. crack it, you're done. And so yeah. and you will see that it will come. Your people will use, they will develop some kind of app or something like that. 
people will use their cameras to be able to take those things. Um, the, the app will aggregate them. And before you know it, it will be part of the presentations and things like that. So yes, it will happen, but you just have to be creative. The lady that talked about professional, I mean, uh, promotional gifts, again, people will buy those things because all you need to do is collaborate with logistics people that go online, they can pick whatever and you can deliver. Imagine if I'm celebrating something, people just go to the site speaking. Do you know that a co-hotel is doing delivery now? Can you amazing. imagine? It's amazing. <laughs> so many things are possible, but we don't have time. All right? Yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mr. Van Kale. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, our online audience, thank you so very much for being a part of today. Um, regrettably, we can't take all the questions that were in the question and answer box because time has, unfortunately, as they say, run out on us. The one thing we can do is to appeal that you send us an email. I um, mean, it's right to communications, that's with an S, communications at winbees.org. Uh, earlier on, I extracted a promise from our panelists, Mr. Peter Balcony and Mr. Omar Shekharel, to do us uh, the privilege of responding to all questions that we won't be able to take on this platform. So if you write to us with that question, where, with your question to communications at windies.org, we would ensure that the answers come to you and the Secretariat will send that back to you um, to fulfill our promise today of learning all that we can from the session. Thank you so much. And um, at this point, I'd like to also remind us that you will get a follow-up email from Windies, and we would like to receive your feedback on today's session. Um, they say feedback is the food of champions, and at Windies, we're certainly that we're champions. would like to take your constructive feedback to ensure that uh, our webinars only get better as we belong. Um, the other piece of good news I have for you is that this is only phase one of the of, 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 of the webinar on SMEs. There's a part two that will hold on Thursday, the 7th of May, 2020. And I'd like to encourage you to make sure you don't miss that as well. Look out for the information on our various platforms and ensure that you're part of it. If you miss it, you will miss out. Please be there and thank me later. It promises to be as engaging and as insightful as today has been, or even much more so, because we only move from one level of glory to another and get better as the days go by. Thank you once again, Mr. Peter Bankole. Thank you once again, Mr. Omar Shekharal, for your time. Please put your hands together. Let's see those e-claps for this wonderful gentleman who have taken the time, two hours of their time, um, to, to answer our questions, to share their wealth of experience with us. And another good reason why you should send us an email is because we also got this presentation. Uh, Mr. Omar has got a slide presentation, which we didn't show today. We will email that to you as well. If you send us that email to communications with an S at windbees.org. On behalf of the team at Windbees, would like to thank you once again for spending your time with Pinta, us. Can I, can I come in for a minute, please? Yes, Hello. you should. Do, do you have two minutes for me? Um, if the audience Hello. don't mind. <laughs> need to go. Um, maybe we because can, it's important maybe we for can us. We have... Okay, okay. I will run it within a minute. We've been One talking minute. about COVID-19 period. And what I said earlier on is that we should look beyond this period. Because after everything is over, that is when the issues will show. Okay. And for us in Bank of Industry, it's important for everybody to note that we will continue to provide business advisory. We will be very okay. close to our customers and prospects. We will continue to fund and do restructuring of facilities where there's a need for that. Okay. We'll continue to encourage the use of our BDSEs so that okay. capacity is given to those in need. There are two funds that are coming that I feel I should mention. Okay. Islamic Development Bank is bringing in $32 million purely for the development of women. And they have chosen three states that this money will be given. Uh, Edo, Kano, and Gombe. It's more like a pilot study. In the next three months, that money should be in Nigeria. 
It is to help women in business. And when you finish paying, it is paid back to you as uh, not loan anymore. It comes back to you now as grant. Wow. As grant. So it is very awesome. interesting. We are working with that. It is called Brave, which is business resilient assistance for value added services for women. They have tried that wow. in Yemen and it has worked. We believe it will work in Nigeria. Awesome. Keep, it, keep in touch with us and we'll also give you the details very soon. Afawa Fund is a fund of $300 million established purely for African women by African Development Bank. We are partners in that as well. So we'll make sure these funds come to you. We are also conscious of the fact that ITF, Smeden, and BOI have to work together, especially under NADEP, to support the young entrepreneurs that are in need. Giving you capacity alone will not work. Once mm-hmm. capacity is given to you, you must be funded. And that's why we are working together. Okay? We'll continue to work and to make sure that uh, you have the best from us. Uh, that's all. Our advice to SMEs is the MSMEs that you